Super Mario World, the hugely successful platformer title that demonstrated how the Mario franchise could evolve into the 16-bit generation, with it picking up many elements from the previous Super Mario Bros. 3, such as the Overworld map. Super Mario World is an even more fleshed out offering that provides a variety of ways to explore and beat the game. Over the years, players of all types have taken advantage of that specific fact, with speedrunners in particular having a field day with the different possible routes and variations across the varying world maps. Maps. Most traditional speedrun completions of this title take advantage of the cape power-up in some way. This is due to how much of a breeze this makes things in comparison to exclusively using the other traditional Mario power-ups. This simple fact has led to many people thinking, how different would a no-cape Mario World speedrun be? With there being many different ways to traditionally beat the game, ranging from warping to Bowser, all the way to clearing every individual exit, runners category by category would develop a no-cape equivalent of their already beloved runs. There is one specific no cape speedrun that caught my eye the most over the years, beating every single normal and secret exit without grabbing a single cape power-up. I've already talked about 96 exit in the past, but what about its no cape cousin? Today, let's talk about how speedrunners perfected the 100% completion category of Super Mario World that bans the most broken power-up, 95 exit, no cape. So we've already established that 96 Exit and 95 Exit No Cape are two different goals, yet kind of similar. They both require you to complete all 72 levels scattered throughout the game, as well as every single secret exit hidden in between, which happens to be 24. Alright, so that's pretty simple to comprehend, but why is the no-cape version of this 95 instead of 96? Well, there is one specific exit that is impossible to beat without a cape, Donut Ghost House Normal Exit. If you're not familiar, this exit entails flying above the level through a gap in the ceiling, which allows you to enter a hidden door, an unlocked top secret area, one of the few non-proper levels in the game, simply giving you access to a few power-ups. Now you may be a bit confused, I said the impossible capeless exit was the normal exit, except this is the hidden path that unlocks a secret bonus area, so it's actually the secret exit, right? Wrong. This secret exit was actually programmed as a normal level within the game, with the normal exit actually being the secret. Here's an easy way to prove it. Using a glitched ore power-up, this is the same item that is used to end the level sunk in Ghost Ship, and when activated from the item box, does the same exact thing, immediately end whatever level you are in. Since it was only initially programmed for the sunken Ghost Ship level, it always completes the normal exit no matter where you are. So using this knowledge, we can activate the ore power-up in Donut Ghost House. And boom, it's actually the normal exit. But uh, that happens to open up an entirely new rabbit hole. You can now beat this exit without a cape. So why isn't the category 96 exit no cape instead? Well, this is because most speedrun categories of Super Mario World have banned the usage of glitch power-ups, due to how much the run would completely change if such was allowed. Sure, there are a lot of levels where it'd be faster to get an orb and then use it to skip past, but do you really want to constantly use this throughout the entire run, rather than just actually playing through the levels? Just just saying it out loud makes such a run sound boring and tedious. Due to such, only the shortest categories 0 and 11 exit allow such things to be used. I will also state that a glitch cloud power-up can also allow you no cape access to this exit, but of course with what I just said, that is not relevant for today's story. With the biggest question out of the way, I also want to tackle possibly the second biggest question. What are the general overall differences between 95 and 96 exit? Well, obviously the lack of cape power-up leads to players being a bit more creative due to not being able to fly over levels, and this leads to the second most broken thing in the game being used, Yoshi. Mario's dinosaur friend not only gives you an extra layer of protection and maneuverability, but most importantly has flight abilities too. Any colored Yoshi can gain wings when tonguing a blue Koopa, but a way more overpowered feature is specifically grabbing a blue colored Yoshi, which can gain flight with any colored Koopa. Now that I've laid down the groundwork for what this run actually is, let's get into how this category was established. Now when I've pieced together record history projects for Super Mario World in the past, it's been pretty straightforward, but today's story is quite different. This is because unlike anything I've covered before, 95 Exit No Cape wasn't always considered an important main category. 
In fact, there isn't a trace of this run being done until the early 2010s. The first place I immediately went to look is an old archived capture of the Super Mario World Wiki leaderboard. This is where runs were documented in the early 2010s, before the rise of speedrun.com, which made things way more centralized. The oldest surviving capture of this board is from January 8, 2013, and we can see that 95 Exit No Cape is nowhere to be seen here. This then led me to dig through another popular speedrun site from the early 2010s, Speedruns Live a place where players came together to simultaneously race the same speedrun category. Scrolling through hundreds of pages, I was able to find the earliest instance of the phrase 95 exit no cape, January 23rd, 2013. I was also able to find two other races over the following couple of days. Using this as our baseline, you could argue that one of these times by Artega Omega and Deathwing were the first ever records in the two hour range, but still feels kind of weird to start off that way. If we go to the second oldest capture of the wiki dated November 30th, look at at that. At the very least, it can be pieced together that between January and November of 2013, it became a serious enough category to get an established leaderboard. The record listed is a 139.42 by LinkedIn. This is a great start to piecing together the verifiable record history, but this goes one step further. On LinkedIn's layout, we can see that he was 12 hours into a marathon he dubbed World Recathon, where he seemingly tried to beat as many records in a single day. Thanks to this, we can see on stream that there was an already existing record before what LinkedIn said on the this leaderboard, a 139.56. Cross-referencing this with said leaderboard, it's very easy to piece together that this was set by Deathwing, who would end up moving down to second. There's an archive Twitch link, but unfortunately, this video seems to be completely gone now, and I personally struggled to get into contact with him. There are three other details I was able to piece together though. One, this was set on September 11th, 2013. This is known thanks to the Twitch URL having an archive snapshot of the page thanks to the Wayback Machine. Two, Deathwing published a pastebin on the same exact day that outlines a ton of details about the category such as his record, a Q&A, and an overview of his route. 3. I found a pastebin thanks to Deathwing's archived profile on the Super Mario World Wiki, which mostly states he played on a keyboard. Via emulator, of course. I'll let you debate in the comments about emulation and speedrunning, but let me tell you as someone who has speedrun Super Mario World for a long time, trying to speedrun the game with a keyboard is a million times harder. I really advise against it, but if you can do so successfully, it's really impressive. While there isn't surviving footage of Deathwing's run, there are a couple of brief highlights. The first is struggling in the Special World level Outrageous, which is notably one of the hardest levels without a cape due to the large amount of enemies and layered levels of platforming. The second clip is also in Outrageous, but showcases a glitch that happened in the middle of a run. Late into the level, Deathwing lost Yoshi, and when beating the level is on a glitched Yoshi which happens to be grey when entering Funky. This is due to the bullet bill launching and Yoshi falling off the screen on a specific frame. If we slow down and pause the footage, you can see a glitched out sprite, and the bullet teleports to Mario's position. This leads to giving you a Yoshi with a switch color palette. Anyways, to get a proper idea of what was being done towards the beginning of this run's creation, I feel it makes the most sense to dive into the first record with surviving footage from LinkedIn. Let's first do a basic breakdown of the route. LinkedIn started by going to the left of Yoshi's Island in comparison to traditionally going right for every other run. This is to get Yoshi's Island 1 and Yellow Switch Palace out of the way. After clearing the rest of the world, the focus in World 2 is to get both Donut Secret 1 exits out of the way, and additionally clears Donut Secret House so Donut Secret 2 can be cleared as well. The right side of World 3 is done, which allows you to make your way down to Star World. Link Dead enters Star World 3 to feed and hop on a yellow Yoshi, which he uses to clear the second cheese bridge exit and Cookie Mountain. He once again enters Star World with a now blue Yoshi, which sadly doesn't last long thanks to multiple deaths. He ultimately ends the world with a blue Yoshi he acquires in Star World 2, which becomes useful for both Star World 5 and Special World. Plowing through Special, the rest of the worlds are pretty straightforward. Worlds 2 and 3 are cleared, which ends with maneuvering through the top top bridge in World 4, and then from there it's clearing up the last of the three worlds before Bowser. All in all, this run was quite messy, but it was enough to beat the first established record by Deathwing. The run has multiple deaths like the ones I mentioned in Star World, and later in Forest Fort where he fell in a gap that doesn't get covered till you beat Blue Switch Palace. There are additionally some silly mistakes such as accidentally entering Donut Secret House again after Special World. A notable level that sticks out in this run is Tubular. The P-Switch is immediately pressed, and a mid-air ditch is done in order to bring him forward far enough to eat a red Koopa for flight ability. Additionally, this run has one notable glitch in Force Evolution 2, where you can use Yoshi to clip out of bounds and swim under the whole level. This was also being done in cape categories with it acting the exact same underwater. 
Unfortunately, after moving past this run by Link Dead, we sadly hit another major roadblock. Continuing through safe snapshots of the Super Mario World Wiki, we start to see another competitor hit the top of the board by the end of 2014. Was... <laughs> I'm just gonna call him Waz for short. There's one big issue though, a lack of leaderboard and video preservation, with Waz not being seen in the slightest on the October 15th snapshot, but having the record on the next one, the 24th. We know the record was at least added during the time, but still does not solidify an exact date for when this 131.58 was set. Sadly, the same thing cannot be done like Deathwing's run, and there is zero archival of the attached video link, with Waz's profile being completely blank. To further add onto this confusion, if we fast forward to November 8th, Waz seemingly beat the record by even more, getting under an hour and a half with a 129.40. If we peek into a snapshot a month later, we can see that this time was adjusted to a 129.39, with an additional note stating that this was set on October 24th. And yet another now erased video. Let me slow down for a minute and let it sink in that Waz very quickly took 10 minutes total off of Link Dead's former record, and we don't even have video footage to look at to analyze such a thing. Fortunately, I was able to get into contact with Waz, and he says he was a quote unquote big dummy for deleting all his former times back then, but was more than happy to share details on how he conquered the category. He started his journey by running two other No Cape categories in the game, No Cape No Star World and All Castles No Cape. Both category names are self-explanatory for what they entail. He claims he put a good 200 hours into routing and strategy searching, which led to a way faster time. His original routes were taken from the 96 exit runs at the time, with his 131 majorly focusing on making the general level by level movement as decent as possible. Once getting a 131 time, he looked into more major time saves across different levels. This led to strategies such as bouncing on saws in Cheesebridge area, fuzzy bouncing in Way Cool, skipping a cycle in Castle 3, and other general peace piece strategies across many more levels. He names Lambie as a major inspiration, someone who most notably has posted tons of optimized individual level runs over the years. In terms of more advanced glitches in the run, he went for the same Force of Illusion 2 clip, but also opted for a block duplication glitch in Gnarly and Vanilla Dome 1, which allows you to spawn Yoshi wings after duplicating blocks over a Yoshi coin and collecting it, which means you can immediately beat the levels using Yoshi. On top of this, he is also able to perform a sub-pixel based stair clip in Donut Secret House, which requires you to press and hold A on a frame perfect spot, the third step in the stairs to be exact. If these runs are completely lost, then what am I currently showing you to explain these runs? Well, while his first two records are completely lost to time, his next record is still completely intact due to it being the last time he ever set in the category. On March 29th, 2015, he completely smashed his previous times with a new minute barrier broken, 128.59. A major note about this route is efficiently grabbing a blue Yoshi to help in Forest, in particular for a secret area. Was just part of Star World after Donut Secret House in order to get a blue Yoshi, and keeps it all the way to Forest Secret Area. This is followed by going back to Star World from the Star Warp next to Forest Fortress, and cleaning up both Star and Special World from there. Waz credits fellow runner Author Blues for coming up with such an idea. With a more optimized route in comparison to Link Dead, his only major time loss in this run was a death in Funky, which cost 40 seconds. Due to this death, he decided to go for some more advanced strategies, with probably the most impressive being a mid-air Buzzy Beetle bounce of Vanilla Dome 3. This allowed him to end enter and immediately exit a bonus room section, which is faster than trying to get through the level normally. I noted earlier that Waz before 95 had also dabbled with other established no cape categories at the time, with him comfortably having multiple no cape records. You may notice that when peering to the cape categories that he is nowhere to be seen. This is because over the years, a majority of runners have separated themselves as cape runners or no cape runners. The cape categories by 2015 were mostly dominated by runners such as Xpaku5, Link Dead, Green Death Flavor, and Dram55, with the no cape side being prominently held by Waz. While some runners did dabble with both, the separation trend in runners has been prevalent in many different ways over the years. In the following months after Waz's 128 record was set, there was another no cape runner that steadily seemed to start making a name for himself, Calco. For a decent bit, he was purely focusing on No Cape No Star World, and got himself as high as 3rd place before 2015 was over. With him not stopping in the slightest, by February of 2016, he not only crept up to 2nd, but not that long after was finally able to dethrone Waz by a couple seconds. 
With Waz at this point being done with Super Mario World, the era of his no cape dominance was nearing the end, with his records hanging on for dear life as new competition rose. Within a month of getting the no cape no Star World record, Kalko was starting to tackle 95 as well, and very quickly put up a 133 as his first ever personal best on the board. With the category still not being too popular, this chucked him up into the top 3. He did the same exact thing as the previous category, and very quickly kept chopping his time, easily creeping up into second, and then on March 20 27th did this. 128.57, just barely beating Waz's now year-old record by 2 seconds. While he may have only beat the previous best by 2 seconds, this run is far from the same. In fact, he took a completely different route. He opted to get through most of Star and all of Special World before beating Castle 2. He then takes advantage of Special World changing not just the palette of Koopas, but also making more of them blue. With a green Yoshi, this makes the rest of World 2 and 3 way easier. He ends up doing the right side of World 3 first, and cleans out the bottom bridge. After beating Soda Lake, he enters Star World for a second time, and clears a level he didn't previously, Star World 2 Normal Exit. This is because he feeds a blue Yoshi while he is here, which like we mentioned before, makes many upcoming levels way easier thanks to Flight. The route isn't the only thing that was completely shaken up, with him adding many more glitches. He may have struggled with Wings and Gnarly, but was also able to do a similar thing in Tubular by chucking a P-Switch into the corner of a P-Balloon block housed next to the pipe. The switch gets stuck and just jitters back and forth, which can then duplicate the block to produce Yoshi wings. This skips having to do the previously tricky level. In World 3, he is also able to keep up the same Vanilla Dome 1 wings as Waz, albeit slightly slower. Quite possibly the most intense glitch he added into the record for the first time was towards the end of the run in Valley of Bowser 2. In the sandbar section, he was able to perform a clip through the sandbar, which allowed him to completely skip a cycle. This saved around 12 seconds versus Waz, with it impressively only being a 2 frame window. While he did add in many new things, this run was far from perfect. In Force of Illusion 2, he struggled with the clip that is done twice, losing multiple cycles between them. He also majorly struggled in Larry's Castle, in particular the second room, which becomes way more challenging capeless due to relying on the Magic Koopa to break yellow blocks and spawn shells. There's plenty more cool strategies to boast about here though, with two of the most notable being Roy, where he deboosted through the spikes just like Waz, but also scrolled the screen to help and Outrageous, which for the first time in a record was executed perfectly, an impressive feat considering it's one of the most demanding levels. The same week he set this, Kalko was simultaneously on a rampage in yet another no cape category, small only. Just a few days before his 95 record, he set a second place time in the category, only being behind Dream 55, one of the most notable runners from the early 2010s, with this being his last standing record. Following this, Kalko additionally going into April would also put some time into Kaizo Mario World, a notable ROM hack of the game full of very challenging levels. He was able to get into the top 3 out of 9 people that had submitted runs by this time. While he may have been on a streak getting top times in other runs, this doesn't mean he completely disappeared from 95, cause he was far from doing that. Between competing in small only and getting closer to the record in Kaizo, he would set two more 95 times before the end of April. The first was on the 18th, and had a way cleaner start thanks to better gnarly and tubular wings, which led to a 20 second lead out of Special World. He was able to keep this pace until his brief return to Star World, where he struggled to feed the blue baby Yoshi. This was late to his pace being virtually Virtually tied out of Castle 4. Fortunately though, both clips and forests played in his favor, being both first try. This not only led to his best ever forest segment, but a lead of over half a minute. While he would bleed some time in the following world, he was able to keep the same pace out of World 7, even though he got quite unlucky. The Magikoopa happened to spawn a Fwimp, which only has a 9 out of 256, or roughly 3% chance of happening. He also last second backed out of the sandbar clip in Valley Bowser 2, but with this lead, he was still able to demolish the record by 20 two seconds, with a 128.34. Throughout the following week, he pushed this even further, which isn't surprising considering how much this run could obviously be lowered by. Exactly a week after his last run, he was on another that started out a bit shaky. He had a close call in Tubular, and also Vanilla Dome 1. What happened not too long later would put a major blow to the pace, with Kelko dying to the initial boo ring in Vanilla Ghost House. While this could have been a simple mistake, there's also a major reason why runners across the board may struggle specifically with boo rings. This is because they run on a global timer. Whenever you encounter 
encounter a boo ring in the game for the first time, it is always in the exact same position. While this may be great, boo rings positions are stored whenever moving away from them. This saves across the entire game, and that means that boo rings can be in completely different positions depending on how fast you got past the previous set. This specifically is really easy to see at 95, as runners go for the stair clip in Donut Secret House I mentioned previously. The boo rings can be in multiple positions depending on if you get the stair clip once, twice, or not at all. With Kalko having a varying streak of stair clip attempts, it's safe to say that the boo rings of Vanilla Ghost House are not always the same. While he was decently behind out of Castle 3, he was able to pull it together leaving Castle 4, even though he lost his Fire Flower, which is a major blow considering he can skip hits in the boss fight. This is due to the rest of the split cleaning up some of the previous mishaps such as feeding Blue Yoshi in Star World 2. With two first try clips in Forest once again, he achieved his best ever Forest split but sadly things would sway once more between losing Flight in Chocolate Island 3 and Valley of Bowser 3. Ending World 7 with some more Magikoopa shenanigans, he was 10 seconds behind. So you may think, this run is 100% dead, but that's actually far from the truth. Remember what happened at the end of last run? Yeah, not this time. He got Sandbar Clip once again, which gave him just enough of an edge to just barely beat his own record by a single second. 128.33. Lowering the record not once, but twice within the same month, Kalko once again took a little mini break from the category and was juggling the two runs I had already mentioned. He took back the record that was taken from him in small only, and repeatedly lowered his personal best in Kaizo Mario World until he finally claimed the record there as well. No matter what though, 95 Exit was a category that still had plenty of future potential, and while he still may have been the only one currently competing at the top, he took the time to come back time and time again to chip it down further. Entering June on the 5th, he had an attempt that started out a bit rough. He struggled a bit between Special World, tricks like Vanilla Dome 1 Wings, and losing Peace beating Vanilla Dome 3, but avoiding his Ghost House death like the previous run allowed him to stay on an already enough pace. He may have been 8 seconds behind leaving World 3, but simply keeping his Fire Flower for Castle 4 this time was huge, and helped him pull 5 seconds ahead entering Forest of Illusion. He did have some further hiccups like briefly falling off of Yoshi in the first forest level, but two first try clips was more than enough to keep him ahead still. Continuing to clean up his wrong, from the record he had last set, he was able to completely swing this run around, being 18 seconds ahead approaching the final world. He had a slightly frustrating moment in Valley Ghost House where you need to guide the coin snake up to the secret exit using the D-pad, which is then used by hitting a P-switch. He aimed the block slightly too low and had to readjust, but even with that, everything else was still generally clean, which allowed him to wrap up 20 seconds ahead, boasting a 128.13. With such a major time cut to the record, Kalko was nowhere near close to done with Super Mario World, but did start to pivot in different ways. His new major focus over the following handful of months was shift to a similarly named, yet very different game, Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island. Over the following few months after getting his last 95 exit record, he would achieve a top 10 time in this game, which is really impressive considering how competitive it has been over the years. While doing this, he was still surprisingly juggling new times in both Small Only and Kaizo. Around the same time, he achieved the personal best in Yoshi's Island that only put him a few minutes off the record. He additionally put some work into defeating the one record Waz still had. All castles, no cape. On September 20th, he got a time that put him only seconds away from the top, with him only three days later absolutely demolishing his previous. This 100% established himself as the no cape king of Mario World. Following this, his stream of new personal bests would slow down for a few weeks, but rest assured, he was still at work on multiple new runs. In today's case, specifically 95. On October 28th, he had a new attempt that for quite a while was pretty neck and neck with his personal best, until Vanilla Secret 1, where he got hit and fell off of Yoshi not just once, but twice. This really shook things up, because he further let more time slip before the level was over. This sadly led to a pace 24 seconds behind exiting Castle 4, except that's not entirely accurate, as it seems he was comparing against a 128-24 during this attempt. Either way, his force was more than good enough against this comparison, because he shockingly ended up being 13 seconds seconds ahead of it exiting Boy's Castle, even though one of his clips took three tries to conquer. He continued his parade of clean gameplay over the following two worlds, and with Larry's castle being decent enough, was on a pace that would give him a 127 time. Unfortunately once again, he did not get Sandbar Clip in the second to last exit, but fortunately his pace was still great enough that he didn't need it in the slightest for a new improvement, a 128.05. So close, yet so far from a new barrier. 
With no one still getting even slightly close to any of Kalko's no cape times, it was really only up to Kalko in the moment to dictate how things would be pushed going forward. He continued his cycle of lowering his small only time once more, but was still equally focusing on 95 as well. Only a few days after he set his new small time, on November 7th he had a run that was giving a bit of deja vu with him dying in Vanilla Ghost House. While he may have been in the red due to this, he was easily able to get back into the green thanks to avoiding some of his mess ups like juggling Yoshi and Vanilla Secret 1. He continued this with two first try forest clips with yet another best split here. He had another mishap of aiming too low with the coin snake in Valley Ghost House, but with a well rounded out world and Larry's castle in particular, he was still 13 seconds ahead, more than enough to break the barrier he should have previously. He happened to miss Sandbar clip once more, but that was perfectly fine, considering what he previously just said did the same exact thing. While he bled even more time due to losing peace feed in Valley Fort, all he needed was just a handful of seconds to break a new minute barrier, which he more than did supporting a 127.57. With him setting yet another record with a notable death in it, among other multiple glaring mistakes, there's no way Kalko was going to end on that note. He continued to push through more sessions over the following couple of weeks, and while it may have not immediately happened, he would strike gold once again only two weeks after his new record, on the 22nd. He had another run start up that seemed quite promising after he achieved his best ever World 2 split, which allowed him to stay within a second of the record. This time around in World 3, he avoided the death previously experienced, but he did wind up miscalculating a jump in Lemmy, which led him to missing the typical cycle skip. Avoiding the ghost house death was more than enough though, because he was happily back ahead of the record leaving World 3. He immediately threw away this lead in Cookie Mountain, as he happened to fly with Yoshi too high above the ending goal tape, which caused the level not to end. This can easily happen in tons of levels across the game if you are not paying attention. This turned to the run being virtually tied with the record, with that trend continuing leaving Forest thanks to Clips playing nice enough, and having a Fire Flower to use with Roy. He wasn't able to truly claw back until World 7 where he corrected his mishaps, with a clean enough castle on top of it. Being ahead, he once again made this a clipless run in the sandbar, with him being able to scoop up further time save nailing Valley Fort this time. Overall, this run was a bumpy ride, with many things to still clean up, but it was still easily enough to be a sizable record, 127.45. With multiple notable time cuts in a short period of time, Kalko would step away again and would tackle the second Kaizo Mario World hack, and continuously lower the time until he got the record there. He also still was focusing on vanilla Super Mario World during this time too, lowering both his No Cape No Star World and Small Only Times. With him additionally tackling Yoshi's Island, he was on a hot streak of new personal bests, and snuck into the top 3 in the main Warpless category. We can see by this point that Kalko's layout had changed, with his Summer Best segments now being visible. It showcases that this run very much could still be improved by another minute. This specific run had a really clean start, notably getting the Lemmy Cycle Skip he previously misjudged. This put him ahead by a double digit amount, with this continuing over the following split, even though there was notably a slight hiccup in Vanilla Secret 2, where he didn't grab the initial Koopa. This trend would continue with all in all decent clips, being able to get a left side backup when failing one. Before visiting Roy's castle though, he had another rough patch. He failed to bounce off a Galoomba that lets him breeze through the end of the level. On top of this, he also didn't have a second Fire Flower to finish out the castle due to getting hit in Forest Ghost House. All of this resulted in a very minor lead entering Chocolate Island. He fortunately was able to balance this out with a really clean World 6, but wasn't able to catch a break in World 7, specifically Larry. He once again has unlucky Magikoopa spawns, and gets flimped one more time. This causes him to be tied with his personal best, leaving the final castle. With that, you may be able to see where this is going. In order to realistically improve his time, he nailed Sandbar Clip, which easily put him in a position to improve his time 10 months later on September 14th, 2017, with a 127.34. At this point, it's pretty obvious that Kalko had a reign over the no cape categories. And for today's topic, specifically 95 exit no cape, but things were slowly shifting whether people realized it or not. As we get further and further to the end of the 2010s, some of the runners I had mentioned earlier throughout this video were steadily running the game less and less, and slowly but surely were being replaced by a completely new generation of runners. 2017 is the year I would pinpoint as the start of a new era in Super Mario World, and marks the first notable beginning of the era I would like to dub the modern adaptable runner. You may wonder, what could I even mean by that? 
Well, if you go back to the early 2010s, and even earlier than that, pretty much anyone that ran the game tended to pick up a wide variety of categories across the game. Some of the biggest examples being Dram55 and Link Dead, who I've already mentioned. These guys got records across so many different types of categories, but then, as you get to the mid to late 2010s, it started to shift towards different types of runners. Those that would run only one category, like 11 Exit, or exclusively run no cape or caped categories, just like the two main runners we've been talking about so far, Waz and Calco. There's one specific runner that I want to talk about that I would argue was at the forefront of this modern adaptable runner era, and his name is Louie. He first started throwing up times at the end of 2016, but 2017 was when he truly made his mark. By the time Calco achieved his 127.34, Louie achieved a wide list of impressive leaderboard placements, such as a top 5 time in No Cape No Star World, top 15 in 96 Exit, and the most impressive by far, the world record in all castles. On top of this, by the end of 2017, he achieved top 3 in both No Star World and No Cape No Star World. He also collected yet another record time in 96 Exit, who was also chipping away equally as much in 95, being the third person to get a time under an hour and a half. In fact, going forward, Calco is not relevant to the rest of 95 Exit's story at all, with him going back to other games I've already mentioned, as well as plenty of other types of runs. Instead, a plethora of new runners started scouring the leaderboards. While 95 would stay generally dormant over the next couple of years, that can't be said for other categories I have mentioned today. Runners such as Louie, Lost Core, as well as many new Japanese runners like Maiba and Desui started to clutter top 10 positions with new times. These trends would continue for further and further into the 2020s, with Kauko being the only exception, trying to hang on to his No Kate No Star World record multiple times. And yeah, you heard me correctly, I'm already mentioning the 2020s, because virtually nothing happened to 95 in 2018 and 2019. The only thing was a 7 second improvement from Louie, but Kauko's record happily sat there for months and months. In fact, it wasn't until May 7, 2020 that we really started to see things pick up. Louie got a way larger improvement, getting a 128 time that was just barely good enough to beat Waz, poking into second place. He clearly had put a ton of work towards learning this category further, because a few days later on the 10th, he would suddenly peak even further, sporting a 127.55, a full minute improvement and a time that would have beaten Kalko during his 2016 rampage. With him already having no cape experience of other Mario World runs, and and Mario titles like Mario 3, it's not terribly surprising to see how quickly he was able to knock down yet another category. After his two back-to-back -back improvements in 95, he was still eager to push this one step further, with him being right behind Calco. At this point, he already had some of best segments that would give him a time a full minute faster than the record. Knowing this, on the 20th, Louie was able to make even further progress. Even though he was over 10 seconds behind Calco for half the run, he was able to maintain this distance, and even got neck and neck by the time he left World 5. Unlike Kalko, he had a backup flower for Roy, and had less hiccups throughout the world. He additionally sprinkled in other new strats that previously had not been seen in 95 among runners like Kalko, such as using a Buzzy Beetle to Yoshi jump off of to reach a pipe quicker in Donut Plains 2, and doing a faster Room 1 in Red Switch Palace. On top of this, he had Vanilla Dome 1 wings that were faster than anything previously seen in the record. Keeping the streak up of new strategies, he went for a different approach to Chocolate Ghost House, where he scrolls the screen to time bouncing on the boo line without taking damage. While he may have ended Chocolate Island with a brief hesitation in Wendy, he was still able to save 3 seconds of Encalco on his way to Sunken Ghost Ship. Speaking of the Ghost Ship, he goes for a different approach here. Previously, every other record went for a quick Yoshi D-boost, which would line them up perfectly to despawn a boo ring that is normally supposed to show up before the final room. In Louis' case, he got through the beginning of room 2 faster by avoiding the D-boost, and was able to be in a position to despawn on both boo rings. Without scrolling though, the boo cloud that normally despawns was still present, which caused Louie to briefly fall off of Yoshi twice. World 7 is where Louie ultimately shines, because he back to back has multiple levels that are clear as day way cleaner than Kalko. His ghost house, Valley Bowser 4 exits, and Larry's castle performance helped him exit the castle a full 14 seconds ahead of Kalko. With his recent personal best not doing a sandbar clip, he opted doing the same thing, which majorly tightened his lead, ending in what was a new, but very minor 1 second record, 127.33.
and the first time in four years, someone finally put the time in to rival Kelko, with Louis being on an absolute hot streak at this time, with his new record still having plenty of improvement such as his slower beginning, and other hiccups such as failing to clip in Forest, he had plenty of more work to do. Over the following month, he would quickly dabble with other runs such as stealing the record in the self-explanatory category extension named Longest Path, but he was still juggling 95 as well. His sum of best was a solid 12 seconds faster than it was the month previous, and on June 19th was cooking up another promising run. He was able to completely clean up the beginning of his run, doing things such as having the best tubular wings in any run mentioned today so far. Leaving Morton's castle, he was over half a minute ahead, with the conquering of the following castle leading to a nearly 40 second lead. With two missed clip cycles in Force Evolution 2, this gap got squeezed a bit, but was still quite large, being 27 seconds ahead still. His Chocolate Island ended up barely being his best world split ever, which still put him on a pace that flirted towards a potential 126 pace. He did the double despawn in the ghost ship, but this time scrolled the screen to remove the booze, and not too long after did a new strategy that would completely change Valley Ghost House. Instead of using the coin snake and P-Switch to climb up to the secret, he instead spun back and forth off the booze multiple times to gain enough height off screen to squeeze into the gap. While this would have saved time, he sadly did the opposite due to messing up so much on his first attempt They had to re-enter the room to reset the boot positions. This lost at least 15 seconds overall. All in all, he had a really clean Larry, which was able to minimize a tiny slice of the previous damage, but he still lost a lot of time in Valley of Bowser, being less than 20 seconds ahead now. This may have seemed like the end of a potential 126 pace, but remember, he skipped clipping into the sandbar last time. This time was different, with him wanting to push ahead of his record as much as possible. Between a successful sandbar clip and a more successful Valley Fortress, he just barely accumulated enough time save to break past yet another major time barrier. Ending with a 126.59, this was not only a new milestone for 95 exit, but was also the biggest record improvement since Waz in 2014. With Luby not only rapidly improving his time here, but also being able to beat the record twice with a major broken time barrier, it's more than understandable to see that after this record, he was more than happy to hang the category up on the shelf. In the following months, he would switch back to 96 exit to push it to new limits, and further pursue other games such as A Link to the Past and Mario 3. In fact, the rest of 2020 was very tame for 95 exit, with the only other notable thing at the top of the leaderboard that year being Ooh Mario snagging third place in May. Pushing forward into 2021, there started to be yet another shift for the game that piggybacks off the new era I had previously started to mention. Multiple of the Japanese runners that had previously made a name for themselves were now starting to properly infiltrate the no cape categories as well. During 2021, they may have continued to dominate the main cape categories, most notably no Star World, but by the end of the year, they would take over half the no cape no Star World and small only top 10, as well as the top 3 in all castles no cape. While well, initially it seemed like 95 Exit was the one no cape category to be ignored by such a trend, that's very much not the case. Runner ZZZPC had been putting a bunch of work into the run, and while this isn't reflected on the leaderboards, he got a high 127 time by the end of March, a time that would put him in third place. He pushes even further by May and got a mid 127. This in a lot of ways is similar to Louie, with the fact that ZZZ was already a runner quite accomplished in many other regards, and was able to rapidly improve upon anything new he wanted to tackle. Just like Louie, he kept pushing time after time, and in June would show off his skill even further. He had a run that was sprinkled with some minor setbacks such as losing his shell for gnarly wings, and grabbing an extra mushroom in vanilla ghost house, but was able to consistently keep things together, and believe it or not, was able to put together a run that proved to be a 126 pace leaving Forest Evolution. He opted for some different strategies compared to Louie, such as the previous chocolate ghost house deboost strategy, and doing a single boo despawn, but this still happily worked out for him as he maintained his pace. He would have some late game hiccups such as messing up room 1 of Valley of Bowser 2, but would happily make up for this most notably by doing the same ghost house boo spin strategy as Louie, but nailed it first try this time. He easily saved 20 seconds versus Louie around here. With a safer Valley of Bowser 3 and sloppier Larry, all he needed was a sandbar, and he could more than easily not just beat his own personal best, but the world record as well. Doing just that, he successfully improved one more time, getting a 126.49, a solid 10 second time cut to the record. 
This run wasn't perfect between the minor choke points I mentioned and other tiny things such as missing a jump in Valley Bowser 2 that is practically luck, but either way, this was still a major improvement to 95 Exit after it was quiet for an entire year. Quite a similar thing would happen like before, and this record would make the category sit for a bit longer. By the end of 2021, Pitman, who notably knocked down the All Castles No Cape record multiple times, would successfully land a time right above Waz. But besides that, things still sat. At least, that's if you only look at the leaderboard. By the end of the year, there is notable documentation that two different Japanese runners were doing practice to try and become the new leader of 95 Exit. The first I would like to mention is Maiba, someone who I've already brought up, and for good reason. By this point, he had already achieved a world record in more than half of the categories I have mentioned today. And at the very end of the year, there is a highlight showing that he was practicing to conquer 95 as well. At the very beginning of 2022, on January 2nd, Maiba had already started doing attempts, and had another that no one wanted to miss. His run started out as a mixed bag, with him having a struggle with Yoshi and Lakitu in Star World 3, but was able to balance that with really clean gameplay and levels such as Tubular. Continuing with Special World though, he would very quickly start doing things that no one had previously done. First of all, he grabbed a Fire Flower in the level Awesome, and you may wonder why he would do this when all the other runners never bothered to do such. This is because he was getting set up for a trick in the upcoming level Groovy that had already been added to 96 Exit, but had yet to be properly established in its no-cape equivalent. By initially spitting a Koopa off screen, scrolling, and taking damage, he sets up for what is a boss kill. He does two notable things here. First, he performs what is a double tongue glitch with Yoshi grabbing the Fire Flower, but while doing this, tongues and stuns this blue Koopa, which allows him to spawn a boss sprite. When properly setting this all up, you can fireball this sprite, and the level immediately ends, exactly as if you defeated a boss in a castle level. While my explanation of this was heavily oversimplified for many reasons, this trick is called Groovy Boss Kill. Comparing ZZZ and Maiba's runs, Maiba saved about 9 seconds doing this. He follows this up in the next splits with many glaring mistakes, such as PSP Troubles in Donut Plains 3, losing the shell in Vanilla Dome 3, and falling off of Yoshi in Vanilla Secret 1, but was able to keep it somewhat together with other factors such as getting two first try clips in Forest. He also mixes back in other strategies ZZZ didn't do, such as Damageless Chocolate Ghost House, but even Chocolate Island still continued with minor mishaps such as accidentally going over the gold tape in Chocolate Island 3. While his pace airing Valley of Bowser may have not seen enough to compete with ZZZ, he had even more things up his sleeve, most notably in Larry's Castle. In Room 1, instead of waiting for the box snake like runners previously did, he scrolls the screen and preserves his p-speed to do a precise jump off the ball and chain without needing the block snake in the slightest. Even with having to grab the midway, he still saved roughly 10 seconds just from this trick. With a faster room 2 here scooping up even more time save, a sandbar clip was all he needed to push forward towards his wishes, with him being yet another person to improve in this run quicker than anyone else could ever expect. This run concluded with a new person being able to boast the record, with Maipa ending this with a 126.43. You may recall that I quickly said that two different Japanese runners were starting to throw their efforts into 95, and you're completely right. The second person I wanted to introduce is Ricky, a runner with a history spanning back to 2018, and by 2022 he was able to achieve top 3 in the category small only, and also dabbled with other runs such as No Cape No Star World and 96 Exit. With him also touching 95, his earliest traceable history goes back to early 2021, where he was already able to accomplish a 133. By the end of the year, he was able to push this as far as a very low 127, making himself yet another competitor for the top of the leaderboard. With his last personal best of the year being a 127.04 on December 26, he continued this journey into the new year, and on the 3rd was pushing this even further. At this point, he was able to keep up with runners like Maipa and ZZZ, thanks to to also going for tricks like Groovy Boss Kill, but did also approach some things differently. In Vanilla Dome 3, he performs spin jumps off Blargs while still juggling the Buzzy Beetle, which allows him to do a shell jump even earlier than previously. In Force Evolution 3, he was able to perform a wall jump off a pipe due to landing on said pipe on a specific pixel. And lastly, in Valley Bowser 4, goes for a different strategy with the Yoshi and Koopas. While he would lose some time here and in other places such as Lemmy and Valley Bowser 3, this was also complemented with some really great backups, most notably in Larry. 
ending with a final Valley of Bowser segment that you would expect for top level runs at this point, Ricky was able to clutch this out and achieved a 126.37, beating the record Maiba just got by 6 seconds. And when I mean just got, I really mean just got. When Maiba submitted his record, he left a comment stating, This is a world record of only about 10 hours. Congrats, Ricky. This means that the 126.43 was easily one of the shortest held records in this game. In fact, there's a high chance it may be the shortest held record of all time if we exclude the two fastest completion categories of the game, 0 and 11 exit. While this may be the final mark that Ricky made on 95 Exit, I can reassure you that his competition, Maiba, wasn't done in the slightest. In the month following, Maiba would continue pursuing multiple Mario runs, including No Cape No Star World, where he took the record there for the first time, appropriately taking it from his sudden rival, Ricky. Skipping one month forward to March, he mixed in both Small Only and Super Mario Bros. 3, two places where he could also brag about having top times. With where I'm going, of course that's not all. On March 20th, he was trying to piece together a new time, and this time wasn't playing around in the slightest. He was aiming to add a couple of new major time saves that if executed correctly, should majorly lower not just his personal best, but also the world record. Firstly, he was going for a different power-up route in World 3, where he kept both of his Fire Flowers Vanilla Dome 2, instead of damage boosting through like other runners did previously, and ultimately this is done to set up for yet another new glitch in the run. Remember the boss kill in Groovy? Well, the same concept can be done in Cookie Mountain 2. This trick was already being done in 96 Exit, but runners had now also messed with a no cape version of this trick long enough to now finally be comfortable with it in runs like 95. Between Ricky not doing this, and additionally having a sloppy level, Maiba saved around 14 seconds against the record just in this level alone. The second new trick of the bunch was all the way at the end of the run in Valley of Bowser 2. Remember our good old friend's sandbar clip? What if it was possible to do this multiple times? Well, you actually can. A completely new approach to the level makes it even easier than before. By grabbing a shell in the first room, you can use it to duplicate the Yoshi wing block at the beginning of room 2, which ends up spawning a key. This can be used to clip through the sandbar just like before, and thanks to this, Maiba doesn't just clip back and forth through the sandbar once or even twice, but does it 5 times. It's used to clip 4 times in room 2, and one more time in the final room housing the key. This trick, that has been dubbed as Nibna Clip, saved closer to 10 seconds against the record here, which led him to being on an absolute killer pace entering Bowser. Thanks to these new strategies, he got not just a major new personal best, but a time that almost pushed towards another minute barrier already, getting a 126.05. While these tricks did allow him to completely tear apart 95 Exit yet again, this run was far from perfect, and is littered with minor mishaps such as getting hit in Star World 3, failing to grab and then stomping the blue shell needed in Vanilla Secret 1, and probably the worst being what happened in Forest of Illusion. He lost both his Fire Flowers in Forest Fort, and while he was able to do quick backups to gain these back, time loss further ensued with a Hammer Brother hit before Roy. With such a major blow to the record, it's not surprising to see the trend of the category going quiet happening once more. In fact, if you fast forward the leaderboard to the end of 2022, it may seem like the only top activity in 95 came from Toro with a 127, but that is far from the truth. There was someone over the previous year who very much made a name for himself in the community, spanning impressive times across so many different categories and ROM hacks, and his name is Schwartz. Sadly, these runs have become a bit buried and disorganized since this player suddenly in late 2023 wiped all of his leaderboard uploads for seemingly no reason. Fortunately though, every run of his is still available, and I am thankful for that because he is the last new runner in the story I need to introduce. While his resume in Mario World speedrunning was very spread out, it's very clear that Schwartz heavily shined in no cape runs. By the end of 2021, he was able to get a low 127 time in 95, and during 2022 would keep shipping his time down with 126 runs, which makes it very apparent he was becoming yet another person that could rival Maiba. By the end of August, he achieved a 126.11, which was eerily close to the record, with him having zero signs of stopping. In fact, just a couple weeks later in September, he had a run that got really close to breaking the new analyzingly close time barrier. In Valley of Bowser 2, he tried to duplicate the Yoshi wing block to attempt Nibna Clip, but immediately failed. 
To still save the run, he also tried to go for normal sandbar clip, but quickly messed that up as well. Keeping this going, he would have another 125 attempt entering October, but died right after attempting a faster room 1 beginning in Larry via deboosting. With two very promising attempts having died at the very end of the game, he kept chucking attempts into this category, and only a few days after his last close attempt, he would have another promising run on the 5th. His run would start out with a mix of things that would keep him behind Maiba, such as a close call on Morton, getting hit in Lemmy, and also not opting to go for Cookie Mountain boss kill. This time loss was easily evened out though. If you remember, Maiba had a particularly bad forest segment, which allowed Schwartz to easily catch up. With him going for the quicker Larry strategy and Nemna clip, he was easily in a position to finally be at the tippy top. He did get hit in Valley Fortress, but no matter what, he pulled ahead just enough to simultaneously get the record and set another time milestone, ending with a 125.58. With Schwartz already being in full force grinding 95, he continued this motivation, and following his record would post in-depth tutorials world by world for 95, and would also post some really cool individual level strategies such as Roy, where he spin jumps off multiple potabos followed by a wall jump, and Larry, where he also performs a wall jump to save time. Obviously, these were unrealistic strategies that simply wouldn't be thrown into the category overnight, but it was pretty clear he wanted to push the category to further heights. He was still doing sessions to try and further beat his record, and on November 28th had a pace that immediately allowed him to pull ahead by a decent margin thanks to his previous mistakes. Even though he got hit in Lemmy, he was still 12 seconds ahead leaving the world. He was able to juggle the same pace all the way to Valley of Bowser, but sadly he did have some mistakes that would bleed a solid chunk of his time save. He got hit by the Magikoopa and Larry, but then more notably also misjumped in Valley of Bowser 2, which also led to him getting hit. While he did lose a bit of time, he still was able to keep things together that allowed him to accomplish a second record in the category, finishing off Bowser with a 125.52. Schwartz may have been able to slightly polish up this run, but it's clear that there was still plenty of room to optimize things. For major starters, he still didn't go for the major new time save in Cookie Mountain, and also opted out of other strategies that add up, such as Damageless Ghost House in Chocolate Island. While these times were being set, his closest rival, Maiba, was majorly focusing on doing tons of different runs in Super Mario All-Stars, but this would eventually shift. With Maiba being good at every category in Super Mario World that you can think of, in 2023, he would set top times across the leaderboards. And yes, I am shifting to 2023 already. Once again, with 95 Exit having a more limited number of top players, its activity completely flatlined for months as both Schwartz and Maiba primarily ran other things. In fact, this 125.52 would sit for over an entire year. Right as the anniversary approached though, Maiba had switched plans and was finally putting his effort back into 95. In late November and early December of 2023, Maibo was continuously doing sessions to once again try and compete in the category, and on December 17th was on a 4 day daily streak of streaming these attempts. In order to catch up and beat this time, he not only kept going for things that Schwartz opted not to do, but also had some new major things to add in. The most notable by far is an outrageous. By scrolling the screen, he was able to fire the hammer bro and get on the platform to clear the pipe. This is the first time a runner went for a damageless strategy in a record level run. This isn't to say the beginning of the run was perfect though. He lost some P-Speed in Donut Plains 3, and accidentally got hit in Vanilla Dome 2 by a shell. No matter what, he was able to stay decently far ahead entering Forest, and even though he lost some time to Forest Clips, he was still easily ahead, thanks to his previous record losing a ton of time in this world. There were still some more hiccups in the last couple worlds though, as he lost his power up in both Chocolate Ghost House and Chocolate Secret. Even with all these minor mistakes, he saved so much time earlier in the game that it didn't matter if he bled a bit of time. To compete with Schwartz, Maiba notably went for the deboost Larry strat, which was also complemented with a clean room too. With a constant lead throughout the run, he was easily able to wrap it up, concluding with a 125.37, completely destroying Schwartz's time. Needless to say, Schwartz took notice of this, because his activity in 95 would immediately shoot up towards the end of the year. In fact, in the span of a week, he improved from a 125.52 to a 125.40, which was done across three new personal bests. With him continuing to grind this basically daily just like Maiba did, just before the year was over on December 31st, he was doing one more session and had another promising attempt 20 seconds ahead of his 125.40, leaving Morton's Castle. A major big difference versus previous records here 
tier was a strategy in World 3 to grab two Fire Flowers in one level, specifically Vanilla Dome 4. He ditches Goshi while simultaneously spinning out a shell, which he grabs. This causes the item to turn into a Fire Flower when beating the level, and he also perfectly lands back on Yoshi. He went out of his way to do all of this because he finally embraced Cookie Mountain Boss Kill. Unfortunately though, he failed this due to messing up the Double Tongue glitch. With World 3 in general being messy in different places, his pace completely flipped and was 8 seconds behind leaving Ludwig, but he was about to have an amazing next world. In Force Evolution, he not only got two first try clips, but also got the beginning Force Evolution 3 wall jump not just for one of the exits, but both of them, a first in any of these times. This shrunk his negative pace, being only 4 seconds behind, leaving Chocolate Island. He immediately follows this up by finally embracing Damageless Chocolate Ghost House. Even though he hit a Chuck and Chocolate Secret, he was able to poke out into the green, and was 3 seconds ahead leaving Wendy. In fact, he was virtually tied with Maibo leaving the castle. Being able to keep his composure across Falia Bowser, he was able to squeeze just enough time save out that he barely beat Maibo with a 125.36, a time that was just under a second and a half faster than Maibo's now previous record. With him day after day pushing to be on top again throughout December, entering the new year in 2024, Schwartz kept this up even though he had the record now, and this is because he was not done in the slightest. On January 1st, he started up an attempt that for the first handful of worlds stayed behind what he had just set. In Special World, he had trouble with Gnarly Wings, and after this would gradually build up more time loss. Leaving World 3, he was 11 seconds behind, but was immediately able to pick up more time, as he finally had a successful boss kill in Cookie Mountain. Keeping things tied together between Top Bridge and Forest, he was roughly on the same pace as last time, being only 2 seconds behind leaving Roy's castle. This time around, he would lose his power up at the end of Chocolate Ghost House, but would balance this out by opting to remain small until grabbing the midway in Chocolate Fort. Immediately after this, he had a surprising new trick up his sleeve a new set of glitched Yoshi Wings. He hits a P-Switch block, which he then uses to duplicate a Yoshi coin like the other levels that do this, and is able to do the final duplication by dropping the P-Switch with Yoshi. While he may have seemingly only saved 2 in-game seconds here versus normally playing the level, it saves even more time due to the fact that instead of dealing with the level end fanfare, you just quickly leave the Yoshi coin heaven. It's important to note that this is the first and only glitch I will talk about today that has exclusively been done in a 95 exit record, and is very much not a thing done in 96. Overall, this Chocolate Island added up to him finally being ahead, 3 seconds to be exact. While he did have a notable fumble in Valley of Bowser 4, he kept things together with an impressive Larry, and was still a second and a half ahead. Scooping up minor time save in the final stretch, he wrapped things up with a 125.34, just being under 2.5 seconds faster than what he had just set the day previously. While scripting this, the record keeps repeatedly getting broken by Schwartz, with him being on a continuous rampage in the category and getting multiple minor improvements since. When wrapping all of this up, the latest I can tell you is that as of recording is that he got a 125.30 on January 20th and a 125.27 on the 22nd, with his sum of best still being a full minute faster. I know for a fact that sooner than later, this record will probably get dramatically lowered even further, and with Schwartz still lowering this time, and the potential future of other runners getting it back such as Maiba, things are bound to evolve. A lot of the current time save comes down to cleaning up general mistakes and sloppiness, combined with things he has yet to add to his run, such as the outrageous strategy that Maiba did in his record. On top of this, there's still plenty of potential time saves that could be taken from 96 exit, but obviously, things have to be adapted for the harder no cave element. Even though this category is very new in comparison to its caved equivalent, 95 exit still has such a rich history with plenty of different eras housing a wide selection of talented speedrunners. While categories like 11 and 96 exit will always take more of the spotlight, I think it's important to acknowledge this challenging category is equally as important in many ways, with it truly showing the skill and determination of the Super Mario World speedrun community. Until further developments happen, that is the conclusion of this jam-packed story. Thanks for watching.